record on this computer. Yep, showing up. Okay, thanks, Ed. All right, uh, Andrew, if you'd like to begin, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, uh, uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank everybody for just taking a moment to watch this uh, recorded version of the webinar. Um, I think this is probably a better way to do it for a number of reasons. The, the best thing for us is that you get to hear uh, several unique perspectives about what an on-combine grain analyzer can do, not just uh, for your business this year, but long-term. Um, there's still time to, to fit one of these to your machine uh, before harvest uh, is fully underway. And, and I think that between you know, the, the accounts and the information that are gonna be provided by Ben, Aaron, Broden, um, and, and Ed, um, each one of them has a unique approach and a unique way of, of approaching um, the data and the information that this uh, on combine grain analyzer can provide. Um, you know, obviously, we're going to have a, an angle towards case IH, um, but, um, but the goal here is, is to really provide good information um, that is, is brand agnostic. Um, so, my name is Andrew Kissel. I'm the AFS product manager for case IH uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and I think, as I said, the, the audience of people that we have for us uh, that are going to talk here over the next uh, 45 minutes or so um, are really going to shed a lot of light. Um, so I wanted to personally thank them for the time today and, uh, and really think uh, you'll get a lot out of this. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Clancy. I'm the general manager of Next Instruments. Um, Thanks for kicking us off today, Andrew. Um, we really appreciate the time to, um, to talk and guide every through, everyone through um, the CropScan 3300H on Combine Grain Analyzer. Um, before we get into the real um, important part of today's presentation with the growers, Ben, Aaron and Broden, I'd just like to spend a few minutes in just guiding everyone through what the technology is. So the CropScan 3300H on Combine Grain Analyzer is a near infrared grain analyzer. Near infrared grain analyzers are used all throughout the world as for trading grain. Um, they measure protein, moisture, and oil in wheat, barley, canola, durum, lentils, rice, corn, soybeans, and chickpeas. So it doesn't matter where throughout the world you go, um, they use these transmission near infrared grain analyzers to measure the grain at the elevator or the silo. Having a system on the on combine is a high speed data collection, okay? The, the sample head will collect a new sample every six to 10 seconds, which gives us a real high spatial density of information, okay? Which is really showing us the variability of what's occurring in the, in the field. Um, up to about 88 data points per hectare, okay? Or that would really mean one data point per every 11 meters. The CropScan 3300H on combine grain analyzer consists of three components, a remote sample head, an NIR spectrometer, and a touch screen display. The remote sampling head is fitted to the outside of the clean grain elevator. As grain travels up the um, upside of the elevator on the paddle, grain will flow into the remote sampling head and trapped by a lower door. The grain fills up the chamber and is triggered by what we call a sample sensor. And that's where the NIR light transmit and passes through the sample, up through the fiber optic cable and up to the NIR spectrometer, which is located inside the cabin, okay? The NIT spectrum is then generated, okay, and then outputted to the touchscreen display. The touchscreen display then shows the protein, moisture, and start, all the starch results in real time, giving the grower many different display views as they're going through. So the first view is the field data. This is what's showing them the field average, um, the, the live tank average as we're filling the, the grain tank. And the last five readings of what we're cutting or stripping at that, at that point of time. And what that's showing is, is showing the, the, the average results, but also the real time variability. Then turning that into a field map. The field map really gives the grower then a, a, a visual distribution of where the protein is, is low, mid and high. Okay? And that would relate to um, soil types, elevation, and also the, the nitrogen applied to those areas and bits and pieces in that, you know, uptake and availability of, of the nitrogen. The third display is the graphs. Every time the unloading auger opens, okay, we'll reset what we call um, the tank average. Okay, and a histogram will represent each tank average that's then collected throughout the field. Okay, after 10 to 20 or 30 different um, unload, unload, unloading augers into the grain cart, 
will basically then show the distribution and changes of protein as you go and cutting through the field. That then data is then displayed into the tank data, which is a table format of the results for each grain tank, which will display the protein, moisture, um, the location, and also the volume of the grain where that's been stored. Then further on, the, the, the virtual icons and information is a, is, a, is a great tool for grain logistics. And that can really help growers who have infield storage like chaser bins, mother bins, and field bins to basically better manage grain at the field. So before the grain is then delivered to the elevator or silo, they're really capturing that variability and making some better decisions to better market it and, and deliver that grain. For the growers with more on-farm storage like silos and bags and sheds and those sorts of things, the storage data tab then allows a real-time running stack average of what's being imported into those, um, into those storage locations. Okay? That then en enables the grower to then make better marketing decisions further on. You know, the heat of harvest, we've got to get the crop off, let's record it and store it, and then we can decide what we're going to do with that grain, how we can better market. Feed grades go here, the bread wheats go here. So why use an uncombined grain analyzer? Well, there's re really three benefits in using an uncombined grain analyzer on the combine. Firstly, nitrogen management. The CropScan 3300H really gives the abil ability to develop um, better nitrogen strategy plans. You know, feed the crop um, in, in different zones depending on that nitrogen uptake and availability. Superior moisture. So having the ability to start earlier or finish later. Pick up that little bit of efficiency um, in, in, in harvest time. And finally, grain logistics and optimizing crop payments with improved blending, okay? Understand knowing what you're pulling off the, off the field to better market and manage that. So moving into the grower talks, I'll firstly like to introduce Ben Cripps. Ben's a, um, um, from Northampton in um, WA. Um, and Ben's had a, a, a non-combined grain analyzer since 2016. So Ben's gonna guide you through some of his experiences and, and how he's used the technology to, to better improve um, his farming operation. So I'll just hand over to you now, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, Matt, I might need you to scroll the screens for me, I think. Yep, I can do that. Please, thank you. Yeah, so a bit about us, um, I guess to give you an idea of where we are and, and what we do. Uh, myself and our family, we farm a, a bit over 5,000 hectares in the Northampton Chapman Valley Shires, which is about 100 k's north of Geraldton in Western Australia. Of that, we lease about 800 hectares. Our annual rainfall is about 275 mils and we continuous crop wheat, canola and lupins and we use the grain analyzer across, across all of those crop types. This year, we've got 3,100 hectares of wheat, 350 of canola, 900 of lupins, and 800 hectares of fallow. Um, we've really taken a, a road down the precision ag line, and we variable rate seed, fertilizer, lime, chemical. We're on a 13.6 metre controlled traffic. We weed map at harvest. We use a weed it. We have harvest weed seed management. All our information is digitally and spatially recorded by all the machines. And that leads, all leads into our grain marketing. As far as the grain analyzer goes, we operate a case IH7240 header with a crop scan 3000 protein meter. So I'm gonna, like all farmers, I wanted to see a pretty well an instant return um, on, on, on our investment. Um, so the, um, Protein meter and delivered to us um, exceptional returns in 2018. So 2018 was a was a massive harvest up here. Beat our best average yield by about 300 kilos to the hectare. We also had astronomical prices um, that year as well. So. Everybody says in, in CB, with the CBH system that we have in WA that you don't need to worry about um, blending on farm because you can use quality optimization out the other side once you, once you deliver it. Um, I would beg to differ because around here, I know a lot of guys delivered upwards of um, 60 to 70% ASW in 2018. As you can see from the numbers there on the screen, 
the first column um, with the APWN at 10%, APW1 at 34%, 31% and 25% respectively. That's what we delivered after blending in the paddocks. So straight away, we were already a long way down on the area average of ASW. So we were already gaining a lot of value. Then we used the quality optimization to actually fix any errors or any grain that we, we couldn't blend in paddock because there was no protein available at the time. So the APWN stack up the top there was something that you had to deliver to from the paddock. You couldn't, um, you couldn't use your quality optimization to blend in. You could only blend out. Um, in 2018, that had a $40 a ton premium. And we, of that 10% constituted about a thousand tons. Um, $40 a ton, 40 grand. Um, clear as day that um, definitely that happened. It's probably pretty hard to quantify the rest for that year, but you know, we ended up delivering 8% ASW compared to an area average of probably somewhere north of 50%. Um, I, I wouldn't hesitate to say that we made an, in that year we made another um, forty thousand dollars out of it as well, just because of that. So, to me, they're, they're definitely worth worth every yeah. They're worth what they do. So, next slide, please, Matt. So, just a bit of a process on how we do it. Um, our blending um, with CBH and the CDF app, uh, we always know where our trucks are. So we usually have a good idea of when the truck's about 20 minutes out. So I start getting on the blending calculator, calculator that you can see there on the, on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and in this case here, you can see the protein in the chaser bins actually pretty handy. It's up nearly 12%. The fill bin one, the protein's pretty awful. It's about nine and a half. And fill bin two, it's about 10.8, 10.6, somewhere in there. So using, using the calculator, we came out at a protein of 10.7 on, on 58 tonne for the, for the truckload in question. Um, that is 0.2 of a percent above what we need to deliver for APW1. Um, so that's what I aimed for. It gets loaded onto the truck in those tonnages thereabouts. I just tell the, tell the truckie where to take it from and how much. When the truck gets to CBH, if because we are running close to the line, occasionally it does go under. I usually send the truck around again, and, and more often than not, we actually end up getting the grade that we want. So it, um, they are very accurate, and yeah, we've, we've had um, a lot of success doing that. Um, the other point is, when there is no protein, um, with the quality optimization, there's a minimum level that you need to hit for that grain to be eligible for optimization so when we have a very low protein paddock, we always keep it above that to keep our options open longer. Next one, please, Matt. So that's, that's what we've done to get instant, um, I guess an instant return from the crop scan analyzer. Um, where we're heading now, as you can see, these, the two maps, the one on the left is a protein map, the one on the right is a yield map. Um, if you look at the one on the right, on the right hand side of that map, you can see the yields are pretty handy. Um, the yellow there is about, is a bit over four ton. Um, but on the, on the same area over on the protein map, the protein's really low. So it says to me that we obviously, we, we probably left some yield out there as high as the yields were. Conversely, on the left hand side of the, sorry, on the right hand side of the yield map, the yield is lower, but in the corresponding area on the, on the protein map, the protein is actually pretty high. Um, so that, that shows to me that we've actually got it roughly right um, because that high protein is, I think it's about 10 and a half to 11.5. So, you know, I think that's, that's not too bad. So where we're gonna take it from here is using the protein and the yield maps along with spatially working out our water use efficiency on year by year on 10 focus paddocks and working out water use efficiency out for those GPS locations 
looking at the protein maps and the yield maps and going, well, could have we actually achieved more? Recording that information and then as the database builds up and as we go into further years, we can go, um, we can then go, right, this year, that was similar. Our water use efficiency was really good, but our protein was either high or down and, and we can adjust our nitrogen management decisions accordingly. Um, so yeah, I, I have, um, have got a lot of use out of the can so far and, and we'll definitely be putting one on the next header. Well, thank you, Ben, very much. Um, great, grateful that you could spend the time today and, and talking with us, so thank you very much. No worries. Okay, so um, next up we've got Aaron Kale. Aaron's a, uh, a grower and an agronomist. Um, he's an agronomist for Ag Vivo. Um, Aaron farms in Bora in WA. And Aaron's gonna take us through some of his uses and operations of the, uh, the on-combine grain analyzer. So um, uh, off you go, Aaron. Thanks, Matt. Um, uh, just, uh, yeah, we're farming a bit south of Ben. Uh, we're about 180 kilometres north of Perth in Western Australia. Probably a little bit of a different farming setup. We've got a combination of owned, leased and share farmed. Um, two locations, uh, 50 k's apart, but very different soil types. We run from um, better soil types, forest gravels and loams through to high rainfall sand plain where nitrogen management is um, is critical, we get a lot of leaching pressure. Um, as part of that, we're also working with a, a larger um, cropping operation, the people we share farm with, we do a lot of work with them, contracting and I do the agronomy there as well. Um, like Ben, full crop, uh, but in, in sort of previous years, I guess it's changed a little bit this year with markets, we've had a strong focus on malt barley. Um, everything's been, again, probably a bit like Ben, data focused, um, lots of yield data historically, uh, the whole farm's been um, EM radiometric surveyed, um, high res uh, cell photography, um, you name it, we've sort of gone and collected over the years to try and build these layers. And from there, we've set up a fairly intensive soil and plant testing history. Um, we probably started out with our soil testing sites at about 20 to 25 hectares per sample. We're now covering more of a grid down to about 10 to 12. Uh, everything goes down to 50 centimetres. Um, and on some of our sampling soils, we're down to 70 centimetres. So getting a really good snapshot of some of the limiting factors in some of the poor performing areas. All our fertiliser and lime applications have been VR for a number of years. Um, so that's the farming. And obviously with my agronomy, I'm sort of putting a lot of that into play with, with my clients. Um, probably you can see in the pink circle, I'm, I'm operating in a, a section uh, in the Midwest of WA. Uh, running from probably 600 mil rainfall down to about 280, so high through to, to low. And now got about seven clients with crop scan analyzers. And that's really helped us close the loop on, um, on the uh, nitrogen management from variable rate point of view. While we purchased the crop scan, um, historically we've grown a lot of malt barley and noodle wheat. Um, and to, to get the, the high strike rate into the top grades, we've basically gone through and pre-sampled every paddock. Um, this was taking too long. Um, you go through and cut every sample, take the samples into CBH, um, get them analysed and then work out your blending program from there. We then decided to run an on-farm Infratech to do it ourselves to speed it up. And it was great, but it was only giving us little snapshots of the paddocks rather than um, the point-to-point -point data we can collect now. So with the share farming operation, we've had one that went on a header in 2016, which was basically improve the, improve the blending efficiency. And then when I upgraded my header in 2018, uh, I put one onto that as well, which, is, which has been good. Um, as Ben touched on in wheat, we've got a, in WA, we've got a tool that CBH lets us use to optimise grain, but the parameters when you optimise actually are harder than, than when you get it into the CBH silo first up. So we've, we're a bit like Ben, we've, we've worked on the, the grain leaving the paddock in an optimisable state to keep your options open uh, later on. The big plus, um, you know, initially we got the blending benefits out of the, the, the protein analyzer, but going forward, the, the big plus has been improving our VR nitrogen applications. So historically we were, we were basing that on um, yield maps and now we've closed the loop in, in essence and we're able to work with yield and protein, which is a much much clearer, much better picture. 
Uh, we also wanted a much more accurate and consistent moisture meter. We tend to get a bit of um, wet weather through harvest. So we wanted to be able to push harvest hours longer and also get back harvesting um, after, a har after a rainfall event much quicker. So prior to harvest, the day or two, if we can see a weather event coming, we'll store up as much grain in that nine, 10, 11% moisture. And then essentially we've got the confidence in the moisture meter on the analyzer now to, to start harvesting at 13 or 14% and blend that into what is a deliverable moisture um, profile for, for the CVH. So it's got us back going quicker. The other option that's been really handy for us with the barley has been in some seasons, colour has been as big an issue as, as protein. And so it's allowed us to, to blend colour to again, make sure we hit that, that malt one grade. Um, so historically through the farm, as I touched on, we've had these layers of data, um, initially high res aerial photography, um, soil test data, that's potassium soil, um, soil layer. Then we've built things like our EM and radiometrics, a radiometric thorium layer there, showing the different soil types. Elevation data through our neck of the woods, frost is, is uh, unfortunately something we have to manage. So that's been handy data in terms of the, building the picture. Then NDVI or plant cell density data, um, and then historically yield. And that's all been great, and it's been, helped us build some very um, tight and neat um, um, variable application maps. But the thing that always bugged us, I guess, and, and myself in particular, was the fact that we were never actually measuring quality, grain quality and mapping it, and then turning that into something that we could, we could further fine tune our, our nitrogen management zones. So we, we do a lot of on-farm trials every year. Um, and I guess the, that there are a couple of um, variable rate nitrogen maps this year. I've sort of bounced between uh, SMS and in later years using PCT Ag Cloud for a lot of our data management. So there's some VR nitrogen maps from there. And you can see there's a little trial embedded down here on, on this paddock. And we've got two on different soil types over here. So I use them as a, a way of constantly um, checking and, and ground truthing what we're doing with our, not just nitrogen, but all our fertiliser management, um, just to see that we're on the right track. Um, basically making sure that we're, our VR outcomes are, are good, that we can keep um, fine tuning them. And, you know, four tonne of, of wheat at 9% protein is very different to four tonne 11%. And what we've found over the years, if we wanted to push this four tonne up towards this 11%, we needed about another 40 units of N per hectare to do it. Um, the reality in doing that, we've probably found that we haven't necessarily moved it up to the 11%. We've probably in, off, in a lot of cases actually taken that four tonne through to four and a half or four and three quarters. Because at 9%, we haven't optimised protein for yield. And at 11%, we've 10 and a half, 11, we have optimised protein for yield. So we've, um, it's given us the confidence, I guess, seeing those areas to push harder than we already were. Some of these areas were already our highest nitrogen applications on our VR maps. Um, but we've even gone harder now because they tend to be where we've got good um, depth of soil, good water holding capacity, and we've increased our top end nitrogen rates on them by about 25 to 30%. Um, and we've basically pulled it away from these poor performing areas um, and, and dropped that away without actually affecting um, paddock average performance or grain quality. So we, we now no longer end limiting our best soil types. It's also unfortunately in the last couple of years with dry seasons given us the ability to sit back and have some confidence to, to just play the season a bit when it's been lower rainfall. When we harvest, uh, generally we'll do the outside two laps and then we'll cut up on the GPS, we'll cut up every 10th um, run line or, or, um, or soil type change. You can see in here in, in this map. Um, this was interesting last year when we were harvesting this paddock, we had a lot of grain that was just on the borderline for screenings to deliver into the uh, CB8 site. So we're running between four and 7%. Um, and when we we're harvesting the seed grader broke down and we basically had a lot of wheat that if we'd let out the, the paddock at the time would have gone GP1. Um, there was about a 40 to $43 differential between GP1 and utility hard at the time. So we basically, you can see the headers running across the middle of this zone here, we ended up instead of stopping the header and stopping harvest while the grader was fixed, we continued on harvesting. We knew this zone up here was high protein and we took a couple of road trains out of there that all went utility hard. 
that basically saved or made us just under five thousand dollars in one afternoon um, just by having the technology there and knowing the lay of the, the protein in the paddock so and i guess we could go through that countless times over the last few years so as ben said they're, they're a technique that um, can can make you a lot of um, a lot of money and save you a lot of time as well um the ben blend the bin blend averages that's just similar to what ben showed so very handy tool I, I keep them pretty tight when we're in the paddock running so we know exactly what we've got um, and then use the calculator as ben showed to um to out turn uh, as, as high quality as we can um, it allows effective paddock blending and, and no leakage. So we also offer, hope to operate where we don't have much grain at the end of harvest that we can't make sure we get into the, the optimum grade. So uh, it's been a great tool for that. Typically our bin averages that we're running in the field bins are running within 0.2% of a CBH load outcome, which I think is fantastic. And has given us a lot of confidence to challenge some, some initial truck protein um, results and we'll get the trucks to go around again and um, it's pretty rare now that we have a truck that fails so if we can get it in it's great. The other one is we do a lot of um, barley and, and wheat straight to end user and it's meaning that we're putting good quality or better quality into that um, on farm storage to have confidence when we out turn that in the middle of the year. That's pretty much um, yeah my presentation. Well thank you there Aaron that was really good to listen to and um, Really excited and happy that you're using the, the real-time information to make better decisions. I think listening to your presentation and Ben's, you know, we've, we've given you a tool, but you really turned it into something, to something else. So um, great job and I really appreciate the, the presentation. So next we're gonna move on to Broden Holland. Broden um, farms in young New South Wales with his, with his, with his father, Chris. Um, and, um, you know, we've done some case studies with Broden on blending and those sorts of things but um, their adoption of the nitrogen management system in moving forward with that um, is, is what Broden's gonna uh, present on today. So um, if you wanna take over there, Broden, and, um, and, and, and tell us about your story. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I think I might have control now, do I? Yep. yep. Uh, yeah, so hi everybody. Um, yeah, about four and a half thousand hectares at Young, um, wheat, canola, a little bit of barley. Um, we. We're doing no variable anything in um, before 16, and then 2016 came. We started doing two hectare grid mapping for pH and P, and also bought a grain analyzer for a header, and really bought it for the sole purpose of blending. But soon, quickly realised we could use it for our nitrogen management. So, I'll just get this going. So, yeah, a couple of questions to probably ask yourself: um, How do we do it? Is it working and why do we do it? Um, you can see there an NDVI and a yield, uh, protein, uh, urea map. Um, I've always spread uh, urea trials, never really seen or never been able to easily see differences in years, but since we've had a protein map, been able to really hone, hone in on some high and low zones and really get some good data out of them. So I just want to run you through our very simple way of using uh, the protein maps for nitrogen. So I don't like spending a lot of time on the computer a year trying to do our VR maps. Um, we tried to look at NDVIs and yield all together and protein and it was just too hard and we didn't do it. Uh, put it in the too hard basket. So I guess we just, well, Dad sort of mentioned, well, why don't we just look at protein? So I sort of sat down and had a little think about it. and. So if you picture, um, these are three of our paddocks from 2017 wheat, roughly the same yield, about four and a half tonne. Uh, you got one at the start here, which is 10.7 protein, one in the middle, 11 and a half, and the one on the end there is 13 and a half. So you got three differing proteins. Um, so going forward for next year in 2018, would you spread those paddocks the same? Well, we wouldn't, we would spread them differently. So we'd probably put 120 kilos on this one, maybe 90 on this one, 30 on this one. So simple way to do it. You, obviously you would change your rates <clears throat> depending on the year, but that's sort of the, the approach you, we would take um, based on our blocks, um, the gut feel and the history. So we sort of thought, well, if we can do that for a 200 hectare block, why can't we narrow it down to a hectare or two? 
So what we do is we get our protein map from the year's harvest. So this is our 2017 uh, protein map from harvest. So as you can see, quite a bit of variability across all those paddocks. Um, picture the same colours, uh, just now we're down to, you know, a hectare or two. So I thought, well, how can we turn that to a urea map? So I developed this little formula, which I'll plug into AFS. Um, and all it does is anywhere with uh, greater than 8.5% protein, give it 180 kilos. Anywhere with greater than 9.5% protein, give it 150. Right up to if it's been 13.5% protein, give it 30 kilos. So we're putting more urea on the low areas of protein and less on the high. So we're, we're, trying, to, we're not trying to get all our protein to around about 11.5. Um, and also we're trying to drag the protein down where we're wasting it and bring it up where we're not using it enough. So we get our protein map, get this formula, and then we come out with a urea map that looks a bit like this. Um, so we've been doing this since 2017, really. Um, um, this block here, it's where Montego is, uh, a bit further east and always gets a crop. So it's had, um, yeah, four pretty solid variable rate applications and we're seeing some good data come out of there, which I'll show you later. So that's sort of how we do it. Very simple. Um, very easy, takes me about two hours a year to make all those maps um, and I don't have to think about it again. All I have to do is just change my rates if the year's gonna get better. Um, so some things we're finding, um, FarmLink from tomorrow, they're doing a, a trial at five farms, 100 hectares uh, with one hectare deep end soil test. So every hectare we've got a naught to 60 deep end soil test. Um, so this is the deep ends uh, sampled in May this year. And this picture here is the harvest protein from 2019 wheat. So as you can see, quite a good correlation there. And that was, we sort of knew that was what was happening, but that was really the cementer for us to really have the confidence in the data. And essentially our protein maps are just a deep end indicator, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, and even in a year, well, this year 2019 was quite dry um, at the end so pretty good to see that in a dry year um, and also these are our urea map one of our urea maps as you can see it's pretty detailed I'm not afraid to make it as detailed as it wants to be um, I quite often hear the, the saying oh you can't have more than three zones in your variable rate maps well we've got about 20 in that one and it does it pretty easy so yeah we just see how it goes and it's been working pretty well and um, with the deep ends too, this year I did some strategic deep ends um, just probably a month ago um, to sort of see in some zones because we're having quite a good year here. Um, some areas have had, well, in the same paddock, some areas have had, say, 90 kilos and other areas in the same paddock have had 420 kilos of urea. And I was getting a bit scared um, about the last application and I was wondering whether we should be spreading the variable rate again because it's quite a big difference. So I did some deep ends um, in some differing areas. So say this, this area here compared to this area here. And the deep ends actually come back the same. So whether you believe them or not this late in the year, but I um, kind of narrowed our, our um, ranges down a little bit. So it's going back towards more of a blanket rate. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens at harvest time. So I guess, you know, is it working? Um, well, these NWIs sort of cemented a little bit for me again, um, not learning my lesson. So in 2017, we, um, well, in our paddocks too, are uh, mostly all old paddocks with just the internal fences pulled out. So in 2017, we had a block here, 200 hectares, uh, an old 40 hectare paddock here and here. Um, so this was really our second crop on this block. Um, with all the fences out. So we did harvest um, and we got our 2017 protein map, which looked like this. So you can see quite clearly these older paddocks. Um, so we applied our formula um, from our protein map to our formula. Uh, and then we come out with a variable rate spread map, which we spread in about April, uh, sorry, spread in about June, uh, 2018. And then we come to our August uh, NDBI. So as you can see, those areas are still there, but you know, quite a bit less than this. Um, and also too with urea, 
you know, in the year that you apply it now, we might only get 40% of it or 50% of it now, and it will carry on through the, through the continuing years. But so that was pretty good. So 2018 um, was a dry harvest, mm -hmm. didn't quite get enough uh, data and I wasn't quite confident enough to use it. So in August 19, which was under sown wheat, um, we just did a blanket rate uh, and that was a bit of a silly move. Um, as you can see, the areas are still there. Um, and again, 19 was a dry year, didn't get much data, didn't have the confidence or didn't learn my lesson, I suppose, um, and didn't spread the map for 2020 and just did a blanket rate of 100, which is a little silly. And if you look closely, you can still see those areas are defined. And I've actually since gone back in this canal undersown and patched up these areas with a bit more. So I really just should have spread the the variable rate map from 2018 this year would have saved myself going back in there twice. Um, so yeah, that's sort of on the NDBI side, um, biomass. Um, and also, so as I said, we've, we've just been looking at our protein. Um, yield was a bit hard for us. Sort of, you know, just didn't want to spend a lot of time overlaying a heap of maps, didn't have the time and patience. So we wanted something quick and easy. So again, we're just looking at our protein for our nitrogen. But what we're finding is as our protein's um, decreasing in variation, so is our yield. So in 2017, we had a paddock, which is Montego, which has had the variable rates um, quite frequently. Um, we had a standard deviation of wheat yield of 2.1. Um, and as you can see, it's quite variable. And then come to 2019 wheat, so after quite a few, couple more um, variable rate applications across wheat and canola, uh, our standard deviation was 1.4 and they're the same legends, same uh, ranges, but as you can see, it's really narrowed up the yield uh, and the protein's done the same thing. And I've tried to manipulate these maps. Sometimes you can make these maps look however you want them to look. And every time you look at them, this is how it looks. And so that was pretty exciting for us um, to see. Um, you know, given that we're doing a very simple job, um, which, you know, we're probably only getting, well, we might only get 70 or 80% of the variation, but diminishing returns, that's probably enough. Um, we don't need to chase that last 10%, 15%. So, and the other thing is in dry years, I was worried, you know, was it sort of going to be reliable enough to be doing what we're doing? Um, so in 2018, um, we had this urea map, which I was going to spread. Uh, it was a dry year, so we didn't actually spread any of our wheat. So this was a 2018 urea map based off a 2017 canola uh, protein. So going into this field for 2018, didn't apply it, got to harvest, did harvest. Uh, and as you can see where this area here that was going to get 150, 180 kilos, what do you know? It's low protein down here was going to get less uh sorry was higher protein which was going to get less anyway mm -hmm. so it really gave us the confidence at least in those years when it was at least drier to maybe just even go and spread these higher protein areas uh, higher nitrogen areas um so then come to 2019 uh urea map it looks exact well very similar to the 2018 map so that's just based off our 2018 protein so it's you know, with that, um, so, you know, that's our nitrogen management. We've, we've underdone it here. We've overdone it here. So in that also, we've probably lost ourselves a fair bit of money. So this paddock, it's 140 hectares here, but it actually goes across into this paddock as well. So it's 350 hectares. Um, 27 hectares in the middle here was uh, less than 10% at half a tonne. That probably should be more like a tonne. At $400, it was worth at the time. So that's $38 a hectare across there. And it happened here as well. So $38 a hectare across 350, that's a fair chunk of money. Um, and I found that in quite a few paddocks across 2018. So yeah, it's really given us the confidence to sort of do what we're doing. And again, it's just a simple way of using the data, um, very quick and easy. Um, and you know, it might not be for everyone, might not be for everyone's soil types, but um, we've got a few differing ones and it seems to be working for us. It's making, helping us learn a lot about our soils and how N reacts to them. So yeah, it's quite interesting and 
Hope you've got something out of it. Oh, thank you, Broden. That was that was excellent. Um, you know, great story. Um, you, you took on the um, the on combine grain analyzer in sixteen. You know, did a bit of blending, but really you've turned it into a nitrogen management tool and um, basically taking data from year one and two and turning that into into meaningful actionable information is 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 really kudos to you. So uh, great job and, and and thank you for your efforts. Great job. So next. Um, just like to introduce um, Ed Scott. Ed Scott's a soil scientist and advisor um, with Field Systems um, in South Australia. Um, Ed's been working with us for about five years now to, to make make sense of the data. You know, we, we, we made a tool to uh, to, to measure uh, protein, moisture, and oil accurately. We knew we could do that, and then basically um, collect that data and turn it into to to a spatial map. Um, we knew that the protein layer was, was going to be beneficial because we understood the linkage to, to protein to nitrogen. But Ed's now giving us the guidance and, and enabling growers with the information and, and simplifying and trying to make sense of it. Um, and and Broden's um, adoption um, and refinement and, and practicing really takes us into that. So this is a bit of a comment that, that Ed gave me a few weeks ago. The CropScan Ag system has provided insights into field performance like never before. Protein mapping linked with the existing yield mapping technology has joined the dots where to focus the refinement of the input applications for closing the yield gap. The CropScan Ag system is built for consistent progress. This technology enables each season to be managed better than the last. So it's going to be a bit of a guide us through on, on the adoption of the, the data and how to make sense of it, where to fit in with other layers and, and, and other technologies that are fitting in the, in the space. Thanks, Matt. coming in yeah so thank you matt as um yeah as matt touched on we've been working with um next instruments for the last uh yeah five or so years and we really saw the opportunity with the the protein layer coming in linking in with the the yield map to like Aaron also touched on bring that quality attributes across the landscape into play and really analyze that in with the yield map which is giving us the uh, the quantity so by linking the yield and the protein together, we're getting the, the um, quality and quantity, which becomes a real driver for then how we can manage these fields um, across a landscape uh, into the future. So as it was touched on, we really need to be utilizing all the, the layers in the system and to turn them into an actionable layer at the other end for farmers to use. At the end of the day, um, turning this whole system into really a nutrient management system to assist crop management and just make the system simpler um, for uptake and getting that um, variable rate um, application occurring. So the sensor layers are still critical. We're still needing that soil test um, data. There's never been more important in, as part of the system, but we can really start utilizing the other layers that are providing insights into the system as well. Um, Aaron touched on some, so Ben, um, look at the EM mapping, the NDVI, um, layers. So there's some of the either setting the scene on the on the soils with the EM mapping and radiometrics and then in crop we can be monitoring further with using the NDVI and other end sensors as well. So that helps build the story and, and around linking that in with the moisture content of that year that's going to drive the overall nutrient input um, rates that we might be applying. Um, but once we can start looking at that yield um, and protein layers that's giving us that feedback loop to say are, are the management changes we're employing here actually having a positive outcome and are we doing better this year than we did last year because that's what it's all about setting the system up to do better this year than you did last year so we can't control the weather but we can control the uh, the inputs we're applying and critically the NP KNS, so your nitrous, phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium are some key drivers of, of the macronutrients, obviously, to, to drive the crop performance forward. So where does it fit in? And it was touched on just with the different protein to yield um, around total nitrogen being removed. And I think Aaron made a couple of good points around just that moving that, shifting that protein level, um, yeah, needing the extra 40 kilos of N um, yeah, required there. And, and where, how, how do we come to that? So basically here's a little matrix around the yield protein um, 
in crop, like that relationship so of the grains. So when the protein meter is measuring the grain, it's measuring the nitrogen content. And from there, we can get a crude protein. So nitrogen makes up the 17.5% of um, protein and sulfur as well is about that 3.5%. So um, it's a real critical component that we can get a true reading of um, the nitrogen removal and sulfur um, across a across a landscape. So to put it into perspective, when we start looking at a field and we see it more and more with the paddocks getting bigger, more variation from previous management to, to soil type and everything, we can get these stark variances in a field. So if we have a look um, at this first one, say 12% protein and a two tonne yield. So in this example, the two tonne is a lower yielding area and higher protein. We've removed um, 42 units of nitrogen um, from that area in that two tons of grain. Comparing that to say um, in another area of the paddock, we might be going four tons um, and only 10% protein, we'll be removing 70 kilos of, of nitrogen. So with that, we can see just in one management area, if we blanket uh, rate application of this, we've got stark inefficiency differences um, across these areas. And like Ben was touching on with his water use efficiency and nitrogen use efficiency, this is how stark it really does um, become when you start breaking the numbers down to the removal to say, hey, we can start managing this better. And then when these, to see these numbers um, here and how much that does, does vary, you can see how that makes sense with what Broden was touching on with why there's that deep end carryover that fragment, say if all this area got 150 um, units of N, this area got, say it's 50% efficiency. And then this area here got much lower efficiency there, only removing 42 units of N. We've got a lot of leftover nitrogen still in that system, which we can be using that as far as that messaging around that deep end story about why we are getting that great carryover and can have confidence in using that protein layer to say, no, that's where that high, high nitrogen in reserve will be. So then with that out of this whole system, once we start getting that yield and protein data, we just want to make some simple outputs. So the farmers can start and farmers and agronomists start using this data and start actioning these layers because with the biggest thing we've discussed with um, Matt over the years is how do we make sure this protein meter doesn't become another yield mapping story. And part of that is, is making sure um, that the end user has been armed with the tools to actually action some of this data. And you see some of the farmers like Ben, Aaron and Broden have, have sort of activated themselves and really read into the data, but CropScan is working on trying to make uh, this data interpretation and having the maps ready for you to action in the field simpler for all users and make sure that feedback loop um, is occurring and you can make use of this, or full use of, of this tool. So out of the, the system, once we have that yield and protein layer, as I touched on with those total nitrogen removed um, in a per, per tonne of grain, we can calculate the nitrogen removal, the sulfur removal, the phosphorus removal and the potassium removal quite simply just on the set calculations. Um, and then we can start turning them around into um, variable rate application maps. So finding the right fit for the system and, and making sure we're, we're maximizing that nutrient management um, component that this system really does, does bring. So when we start benchmarking the analysis, this is how we start interrogating it. And it's just simply looking at that yield protein and try and generate that towards the, the um, what we call a performance map. So on the right hand side, we've got this yield and protein maps and you can see here the yield and the protein in this example are inverse to each other, high yield, lower protein. And this is in a June swale system. So great soil variability, but it is a great stark representation of, of that variability that does occur. So with that, once we see this variability, we can calculate the overlay and turn these into four performance zones. So a red zone, a blue zone, yellow zone and a green zone. So we can then work out where this performance is limiting. And critically, it's linking back to where's moisture available and where's the nutrition available. So when you do get a, um, a, a nutrient management system and the um, approach out of the crop scan um, ag solution system, we're trying to simplify the outputs. And with that, you get the review booklet, which breaks down each of your uh, fields into how they performed. So once we've got those performance maps, 
this is the correlation quadrant, just showing you the, the green zone, the high yield, high protein in green. Um, that's our target zone. And we can hold that protein at whatever your target zone is, but we often head for the, the sweet spot around that 11, 11.5%. Um, in the yellow zone is our high yield, low protein. The yellow zone, that's the, that's the opportunity zone we, because we've got the yield, we've had the moisture to build the yield. We haven't had enough N to fill the protein. So that's our opportunity zone. The red zone is also that, but can be some more underlying issues as why we haven't got that yield as well as the protein. And then the, the, where we've got the scope for managing the nitrogen is out of the blue zone. So the blue zone, when you see the blue, think moisture limited. Um, so that we've got a lower yield, so it's been limited by moisture. And as a result, we've got the higher protein. So that is where we've essentially applied too much N um, and we can, uh, for, for the removal, so we can use some of the nitrogen from there, which um, in this histogram down the bottom, this represents in another way, which is how we produce it in the review booklet, is the green zones, what our target's been, 50% of this field um, has been in the green zone. Um, so that's been our, our target of that high yield, high protein. We can see the blue zone here has been where we've had the higher protein so and lower yield. So we've had too much N applied here based on that year. And the yellow zone, like we touched on, that was the higher yield and lower protein. So that's where nitrogen has been limited. So we'll quickly reference this and say, well, the yellow zone uh, needs more N. The blue zone is an area that had too much N. And we can say, right, let's shuffle some of the nitrogen from this zone across to the yellow zone and bring that yellow zone into the green. And that's the base sort of fundamentals of what's occurring to improve the nutrient management overall. So the questions we need to be asking um, when we are looking at this data is that we keep talking about where the yield gap, closing the yield gap. But when we start looking at a, at a field basis, it's really hard to define where those opportunities are and different zones within a field have different capacities to, to fill a greater yield gap. And that's what we're really seeing by this, this data. It's really giving us the, the areas of interest to really point us towards where we can really improve our nitrogen um, efficiency um, and, and how we're going to improve that. Is it split applications? Is it riding the, the moisture? Um, do we back ourselves in for that extra application later on in the year? And then with that, we can link that into a water use efficiency um, um, monitoring and, and measuring like Ben touched on as well. So at the end of the day, this system is really trying to link that soil moisture, which is driving the yield, linking that with the soil fertility, which is driving the protein, which is going to essentially govern our soil management strategy. And out of this, it's leading those insights into an action plan. So out of this, try to really break it down, especially working with some of the, the growers who are, have been on the, uh, I guess, the early adopter road with the, with the system is how do we optimize that yield in the field? Because that's what we're really trying to do with this system is use the protein data to really work out where those windows of optimization are to close that yield gap on the areas that will respond. So year one, like, the best thing you can do is start. Um, so when you've got it um, installed on your harvester, it's collecting that good protein and yield data because we can start utilizing that data to make the blending decisions. We can, like Matt touched on, have superior moisture management and and Aaron touched on as well, just been able to utilize, especially in those higher risk areas where every hour counts on how much um, harvest time you can capture. Really critical piece of um, um, hardware that can be adapted to a, to a harvester. So um, grain storage and marketing, um, like they all touched on, and assess the variable rate options from the data. And then once we have that data, we can then start using that straight away into that year two. Because once we have that, like we've touched on, we can then quickly define where our N limited zones will be. And that's the first step that we're going to be doing is work out where N's limited and how do we improve that decision making around those zones. So not asking you to do the whole field, it's picking out some of the, the key paddocks. So a lot of people will assess their, their say wheat paddocks and say, how do we make that wet, those wheat zones turn around and, and improve that and prove it to yourself how we can improve our um, decision making. So increase essentially the fundamentals are increasing the N on the yellow zones as I touched on and decrease the N applications on the blue zones, which were the moisture limited and getting poorer utilization of the applied nitrogen. And then we've still got that option to blend the, the grain um, using that protein data layer. Year three is becoming a great time to really cross validate with that deep end testing like Broden touched on 
and then we can start using once you've got confidence in that data layer um, it's then you've got more confidence to extrapolate out your deep end readings and it's amazing once you do have have that confidence that deep end across a landscape um, yeah it's, it really does start driving um, your own sort of system confidence around backing yourself into apply more nitrogen where you need to and have a greater difference in your highs and low um, application zones, probably greater than you ever expected when you initially went into the program. So once we start closing the loop on that three to four year rotation, we sort of close the, um, close the, the door on a, a full rotation of, of a farmer. We can then start working out, are certain zones always moisture limited? And they become really our hotspots and saying, what else is holding those areas back? If they're all getting the same rainfall, why are they still a blue zone, a moisture limited zone? And that's really pointing us to some of the areas where um, other opportunities or strategies are being employed, such as deep ripping or alternative soil management strategies that can be really targeted. Year four, we're sort of um, really sort of starting to see that step up towards um, backing yourself in on using the, the system across your whole farm and understanding how it's working in, in with the canola and your legumes and what that means for that carryover as um, nitrogen coming out of a legume phase and that sort of thing. And then once we step to that year five, we've, we feel we've really closed that loop on achieving that nitrogen management system, which we're striving for. So really trying to hone in on that nutrient and nutrient, especially nitrogen use efficiency, making sense and actually having a positive impact on our water use efficiency across the landscape by using those performance maps and, and trying to close that variability down. It's a real critical point what Broden did touch on, saying we've got to manage that variability or reducing that standard deviation of that protein reading. And then with that, we can do quite simply the profitability maps based on our as applied maps to what's been removed. We can quickly close the loop and do a, a simple performance summary around how that overall um, field and farm has performed. So breaking it down, it's understanding your variability, having a simple approach to use that harvest data to have an action plan to implement in that next year and subsequent years within a rotation. Our target is to improve that nitrogen use efficiency and water use efficiency. That's how we're gonna be driving, closing that yield gap. And with that, our main two data layers we're using as that base is, that, um, is by optimizing that yield and protein layer. So hopefully that's sort of closed in at some of the background around um, how Ben, Aaron and Broden have been utilising the data in a, in a real world sense and getting some amazing runs on the board. It's been great to hear um, all your perspectives today around how you've yeah, taken that vision and, and really had some positive impacts around your own, own system and each of you have, have taken sort of that different angle around uh, getting that action um, and results out of the system. So that's it from me. So thank you, Matt. Thanks, Ed. Really appreciate the time and, and effort to put on that and, and kind of um, taking the complexity and really just simplifying and nutting it down. And, and, and having that five-year approach is, is a real good um, leader for, for other growers. You know, we don't want that yield data or the data sitting in the displays for, for six years and then the next technology comes along and they didn't utilise it. So, you know, grabbing that data from year one to year three, actioning it, moving along, and, you know, we're going to see results like Ben and, and Aaron and, and, and Broden. Which is which is what we want. So thank you. So this is where you can kind of take over, Andrew. We'll probably do a bit of a cutting and editing, but um... yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Um, I think the the big thing for me, and and the big thing, you know, from a case IH point of view, is is the fact that this technology is been something that, that we've been working with the next instruments on for for several years right um, and and it's still a technology that, that we believe in um, I think that it it is single-handedly one of the most exciting things and I think the the different I guess use cases that you've heard over the last half or last hour or so demonstrate that regardless of what you're trying to achieve in your operation an on combine grain analyzer is something that can help clarify and, and really help you understand what's happening and that how much yield are you leaving in the field? I think is it's certainly something that resonates with me. Um, this on combine grain analyzer is just the next piece of the puzzle to really understanding out that variability, you know, from spot to spot within your paddocks. And I, I truly believe 
uh, it's something that is beneficial to every operation. Now, with that said, um, that's all I've got for today. I, I wanted to take some time to personally thank uh, everybody that spoke today, you know, uh, Ben, Aaron, Broden, Ed, uh, and Matt are all extremely busy and, and um, their time is, is very valuable to, to me and, and to Case Ipes. So I wanted to personally extend a thank you to you guys. Uh, this certainly would not have been uh, anywhere near as informative without your help. So thank you guys. I, I really do appreciate it. I think that's it. Ah, thank so, you. Good one. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Great job. Excellent. Um, Thanks, guys. That's my comment, Phil Clancy. Fantastic, guys. Really, Ed, that, your summing up was just fantastic, but input from the other three guys in terms of real data um, makes such a big difference. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Good to meet you all, too. <laughs> well, I think how Broden touched on it yesterday, having a group and, and, and doing something like this, you know, post harvest, I think that's going to help more people. So, um, yeah, I think we kind of um, conjure up something um, mid to post harvest and sync up some ideas and, and we'll have a bit of a, a team. So um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrew, for um, allowing us to um, present. Sorry about the, that, but I think we just got to move on with that. and. It's memorable. <laughs> well put. Well put. I had a couple of good texts. <laughs> you know, any publicity is good publicity. Okay? That's it. That's it. Somebody felt so strongly that we were doing this today. They wanted to be a part of it, and they were upset they didn't get an invite. That's what it seems to me. Anyway. Oh, just beautiful. I yeah. uh, appreciate the time, guys. I really do. I'm uh, I'm going to reach out to all of you uh, to get your addresses. Um, we'll send you something in the mail just for your time. So thanks again. I, I do truly appreciate it. I know it's a busy time of year. So thanks a lot for all the effort you put into it. No, thanks, guys. <clears throat> thanks, Bryce. Right, yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Ben. Cheers. Okay. See ya. Right. See you later. See ya. Yeah. Hope it's not too hot up there today, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Greatly appreciated. Excellent, ex well executed. So, good job. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Connor. Um, I'll I'll compress that video now and I'll shoot that over to you, and then you can cut and shut it as pleased as you want. Beautiful. Yeah, just if you could send them both through. That way, uh, that way, when our our PR people write an apology, they know what they're apologizing for. <laughs> I think I cancelled the other one. I just, All right, that's fine. I was in such a nervous, I just shut it down. I'll, I'll see, but I, I think I just said stop. So, All no, right. That's fine. No okay. worries. Great. I won't do that on this one, though. And um, I think we'll can't, um, well, let's have a chat about tomorrow's meeting. So, yeah. Yeah. Righto. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.